Thank you, Bonnie. We're going to get started with Steve Wright. Steve is the Chief Marketing Officer at JP Resort. Steve has been at J since 2004 as Head of Marketing, and he's been involved in the transformation from what was a sleepy area with a cult-like following into the major destination that it is today, just south of the Canadian border. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Wright. Which? Stan. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're going to start with one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all, I'm excited that I'm an executive. I had no idea that the executive suite, this is, uh, this is good news for me. <laughs> yeah. Talk to us about the investments that Jay has made to diversify your business on a year-round basis. You've made some really hefty investments, and I want to hear about what they are and how they paid off for you. Um, it's important, I think, to, to take a step back to where we started. When, when I started at Jay, 2004, you know, we were at about 150,000 skier visits um, and very little else. We had 100 rooms, we had one restaurant, we had a bar that was sometimes open, sometimes not, and that was pretty much it. And we marketed ourselves as a Spartan ski experience, mostly for hard, hard, uh, hardcore skiers because of the train that we had. And uh, I think we started to realize that as, a, as a, an opportunity to move forward, um, the index of our, of our profit that was being pointed towards uh, lift ticket sales was concerning for us, mostly because of the weather, but you know, we were exposed. So um, at that point, we, uh, we planned out to add you know, three times the lodging, um, a hockey rink, a golf course, and then a 65,000 square foot water park. So um, you know, 50% of our guests come from Canada, 50% come from the US. And the U.S. guests have to drive by just about every ski resort in New England. The Canadian guests have to drive uh, and deal with a customs issue. So they had already had a pretty high level of commitment. Um, and our concern in, in going forward was, uh, with that was, you know, these guys identified themselves as skiers. And here we were adding all of these elements that were as about as, as non-ski related as you could ever come up with. I mean, the... the the previous uh, marketing campaign that we had prior to that was, if you're not here for the mountain, you're not here. So literally, <laughs> literally in one year, we went from we have nothing, and we're proud of that, to we have everything, come enjoy it. So there was a, there was a marketing challenge and really a brand understanding challenge that we had to go through for that, and a realization that you know, at that point immediately, we had three different audiences we had to talk to. We had to talk to our existing skier base and say, we're not changing. Don't, don't worry. We had to talk to you know, other skiers in our market that maybe had never come to Jay simply because there was nothing else there. You know, they, were, they were very difficult to take a five-day vacation when you know, you've got one restaurant and that's it. So we had to talk to them in a different way. And then we had to talk to you know, this segment that we had no idea on how to speak to them, which were you know, chronic water parkers. <laughs> and let me tell you, <laughs> The, we, had, we had really no ground and no solid footing in how to do that, so we sort of learned as we went, but as, as uh, some of the other speakers were talking about, there was definitely a leap of faith that was involved there that we had about an 80% understanding of what we were getting ourselves into, and you know, that, that remaining 20% is that leap and that, you know, that courage that Kirsten was talking about. Is, if, you, if you don't uh, attempt to innovate, if you don't try to round out that experience and try to bring in people who aren't necessarily buying lift tickets as a way to boost your profit line, um, you're gonna always be subject to the, to the vagaries of weather. And that's not a position we wanted to be in. Great, all right, yeah. thanks. Have a seat. Oh, that way, okay. This way. Next up, we have Jurg Schmidt. Jurg is the CEO of Switzerland Tourism. Switzerland Tourism is based in Zurich and has offices in 26 countries around the world and Jurg oversees over 260 employees. He's been in this role since 1999. In the past week, Jurg has been around Colorado a little bit, so let's provide a warm Colorado welcome to Mr. Jurg Schmidt. Hi, Bruce. Jurg, welcome to Colorado. Thank you. I know that you had a trip over to Vail yesterday. Yeah. Got stuck a little bit on Vail Pass, trying to get back. You visited Breckenridge, and now you've been here in Keystone. Give us an idea of the difference that you've seen in Colorado versus what you're used to in the Alps. Um, first of all, it's such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Mike, you really have to bring that over to the Alps, to the Swiss Alps, to be precise. Uh, I'm really impressed by 
the quality of the slopes. Grooming is close to perfection here by the size of the ski areas. Also by the altitude that makes you breathing when walking up and climbing up the stairs. But that obviously is also the source of this magic champagne powder you have here. I'm really jealous for that. Uh, the quality, the friendliness of the staff, service level is surprisingly high, definitely high. Uh, okay, I have to admit the mountain scenery in Switzerland may be a bit more dramatic. Uh, please forgive me for being so straightforward. Uh, the villages may be a bit more authentic in Switzerland, but I think it's not about being different. I realized when talking to many leaders of the business here, of the industry, I realized that we have so many things in common. We face the same challenges in Europe, in the Alps. We have a stagnating number of skiers. I mean, we used to be Switzerland, the true skiing nations. I mean, there used to be times 50, 60 years back when really every Swiss was skiing. Today, it's only two thirds of, of the Swiss that are skiers. 35% of them being active skiers. I know this is a high figure compared to US, yeah? Uh, but still so, we have the challenge to bring on the next generation of Swiss on skis, of bringing on new people of new ethnic groups on ski. We have the challenge to build up a great summer business. We strongly believe that we have to have two strong seasons, two strong profitable seasons. And winter tourism as such, I believe skiing is the most beautiful thing you can do, and I'm sure you, most of you here will agree with that, but still so we have to face it. The trend is not, the big trends in the travel industry is not skiing, so we have to really work together to, uh, to promote this lifestyle we offer, the skiing and the unique winter experience. So there's more things in common than differences. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. All right, have a seat. Next up, we have Rob Perlman. Rob is the President and Chief Operating Officer at the Steamboat Ski and Resort Corporation. Prior to that role that he gained last summer, he spent seven years as a Vice President at Steamboat. Before that, he was the President and CEO at Colorado Ski Country. Please welcome Rob Perlman. Thanks, Bruce. Good to see you. Hey, Don. So let's talk a little bit about branding. Steamboat has an incredibly authentic, almost iconic brand. You already talked about champagne powder, which I believe is trademarked. It is. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't find anything of that in Keystone, <laughs> over in Steamboat. <laughs> We're all among friends. Okay, so tell us about the authentic brand that you created at Steamboat and how you've seen it help you set yourself apart from competitors and what other resorts can think about as they really build into their authentic brand. You bet. Uh, a couple things, you know, when we talk about brands, obviously all ski resorts are uh, green trees, blue skies, and white snow. So what differentiates one resort from another resort? Uh, I didn't really build the brand at Steamboat. You know, we're all stewards of the brand. It's been around since the early 1900s when Carl Hallison founded, you know, Hallison Hill and the skiing uh, in the valley, and it's continued on uh, through the Steamboat brand for many years. Uh, Steamboat's been around 53 years, obviously known for its champagne powder snow, um, uh, and also its great family traditions in terms of kids ski free has been around since 1986 at Steamboat. So obviously very family focused. We talk a lot about Ski Town USA, which is another trademark uh, for Steamboat and our Olympic heritage, uh, having 88 Olympians uh, that call Steamboat home in a real town with real people and very authentic. <laughs> and we also talk a lot about uh, you know, our Western hospitality. And these are the things that kind of differentiate us from our competitors. And I think every resort out there has unique experiences or unique characteristics that they need to focus in on to differentiate themselves from other resorts. Because at the end of the day, it's all about getting outside and enjoying that active lifestyle. And we talk a lot about that you know, how can we get more people to participate in our sport and to visit our resorts rather than go to beach destinations or the Caribbean or do other things where, you know, it's not that active lifestyle, not that multi-generational experience uh, that we can provide. So we take it very seriously to protect and uh, strengthen the Steamboat brand. And I think everybody can focus on unique aspects of their experience uh, that makes their resort special. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right. Have a seat. 
Next, I want to introduce to you Matt Mosteller. Matt is the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience at the Resorts of the Canadian Rockies. Matt's been involved with customer experience since 1994, when he was the manager of customer experience at Whitefish Mountain Resort. Fast forward 22 years, and he's still focused on the customer experience at RCR, which is the largest private owner-operated ski resort company in North America. They have six resorts across Canada. Please welcome Powder Matt. Thanks, Bruce. Good to see you, Matt. Hey, Bruce, just in the, the fashion of being a real ski bum, have a seat. <laughs> That's my seat. That's your seat? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so... We, we like to couch surf. Okay. That's true. Um, talk to us about customer experience and what you've seen of how you can really take the promise of the customer experience for skiing and snowboarding and the reality of customer experience, which isn't always equal to the promise. And what are some of the innovations that you've seen, not just at your resorts, but elsewhere, that have helped to bring those two together? Pot. <laughs> well, that's good for Colorado. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's definitely changed. But uh, the, the interesting thing that uh, I, I see, and we look at us, now you don't have it, but most of the executive suite team members have gray hair. And, and a real challenge is the executive teams don't match the market uh, that's uh, making up the, a significant part of the, the visitor growth for the future. And I think one of our, our biggest challenges with that, um, I, I see three key areas that this new, uh, we have a tectonic shift happening in the marketplace, and we need to focus on surprise and delight as one. At Fernie Alpine Resort, which is on the Powder Highway, if a person loses their phone, which is a common thing these days, they come to our lost and found, and we hand them a new phone with their service provider all taken care of, and they're ready to go. You get a big wow, unexpected. The second one is make your mundane matter. You know, everybody has these mundane areas where it's lift lines and uh, ticketing, uh, lift lines at the lift, et cetera. And how you make your mundane matter, really dig in deep with your team and figure that out. Again, at Fernie Alpine Resort, I'll use an example. Uh, we get over 40 feet of snow a year, uh, so avalanche and snow safety is a big deal for us. And we didn't know how big of a uh, 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 crowd appeal our avalanche uh, safety dog program has. It's huge. People love dogs, and, and people love animals in general. And so just having our dogs go around the lift lines, the ticketing lines, change the whole dynamics and experience of those lines and, and the queuing up deal. And the last one, and certainly for the millennials, micro <coughs> moments really, really matter. And how we make those things uh, uh, stand out, how we, we, it's not just once, two, it's three, four, five, ten times a day. <laughs> and how you can dig into the soul of your resort to make that happen. And part of that, uh, like at, at Fernie, we do 80s really well. It's a big deal for us, and our, our team get behind celebrating 80s. There's a reason why Hot Tub Time Machine was filmed there. Uh, our, our staff are crazy, and, and they have fun. So they're constantly making zany things happen each and every day throughout the guest stay. It matters. It makes awesome. a difference. Thank you. Okay, so for the next half hour or so, we're going to go through some of the topics that you just heard about and probably a few others. Uh, if we can bring up our poll... Um, what we're going to do is ask you in the audience to help us decide what to talk about. So take out your phone. I know you don't usually hear that at a conference. And you can send a text message to that 650 number you see on the screen. And then decide what you want to hear most about. Use the number that's just below the topic in your message. And that will start to record the votes. Okay? So we'd appreciate to see some uh, response up there. And that will help us direct our conversation in the next half hour. While you're all voting, uh, let's talk about skier days and where the industry is today. Skier days seem to be the metric that everyone thinks about. It's stagnant, it hasn't really gone anywhere in 10 years. But is it really what we should be thinking about? Because I would imagine that you guys and your bosses and owners really care more about profitability. Um, and are skier days and profitability in line, or is there a pretty big difference? So, Steve, why don't you start with that? Well, I, th I think that... Um the profitability piece with lift tickets is that the, you know, the lift ticket sale drops you know, pretty much directly to the bottom line and has that element of profitability to it. The problem is, is that it's subject to, like I said, the vagaries of winter and, and what weather is doing. So we sort of focus on revenue. 
you know, however that comes to be. Um, part, of, part of what we did when we built the water park and the, and the hockey rink, we thought that you know, there were, there were going to be elements, admission-based uh, revenue that we'd see there, but really what we've seen is uh, lodging compression as a result of those two that has you know, completely, completely changed you know, the, our game here. We have seven or 750 rooms at the resort, um, and more than half of them on any given weekend are dedicated to purely water park vacationers or hockey teams. So that's fundamentally changed the way that we've looked at our business and, and, and fundamentally changed the way we've looked at, uh, at profitability. Jörg, what about in, in the Alps? Um, how are the resort owners? It's very different ownership structure, first of all. Yep. And maybe you could speak to that real quick and then just talk about you know, who's looking at profitability versus skier days. I think the main difference is that in the Alps, it's grown over hundreds of years. So it's a spread family business. You have hundreds of companies that make up a destination. Uh, most of the case, it's one mountain company, so that runs the lifts. But ski schools are separate. In an average size destination, there may be 18 independent ski schools. Now, the bad thing about that is organization streamlining the processes. The good thing is you have competition. So prices are lower, yeah? Uh, now, at the end of the day, I think the profitability is what is important because if you don't make a profit, you cannot invest and renew. But what in Europe we see, we had a period uh, where we were totally focused on the skier days. However, now it changes into total focus on customer experience. We see in Europe that less and less skiers are, we call it avid skiers, so uh, thrill skiers, they ski from morning to evening. More and more we have skiers uh, that go up uh, and they may just do one or two downhills and then they go in the restaurants. So you have the gastronomy along the slope. So this total experience of gastronomy of the slopes, the ski experience, the upper ski, all this together makes a total ec the total experience. So I strongly believe this is the focus because at the end of the day, a good product and a great experience is the best marketing. So Rob, you work for a public company and they focus a lot on profitability. What, where do you sit on skier days versus profitability? Well, uh, a wise finance person told me maybe more than once, you don't take, you don't take skier visits to the bank. So obviously uh, we're very focused on profitability, uh, but as Jurg says, you know, it's about the overall experience. Uh, obviously lift tickets is kind of the common metric uh, skier visits is the common metric we use to kind of judge, uh, you know, the volume of visitors uh, to our resorts. Uh, but it's more about profitability and it's also about the total guest experience. Uh, we're into, you know, trying to diversify our business so we're not just lift tickets, but it's ski school and rentals and food and beverage. We've been very focused on food and beverage uh, the last uh, several years. It's lodging, it's accommodations and all those things. And then it's about the guest experience. And we're very focused on making sure we provide a, a spectacular and a rewarding guest experience for our visitors uh, because that will lead to greater profitability, greater visitation, and ultimately uh, uh, greater numbers on the bottom line. Okay, so hold on that. Um, show, go ahead and show the results of the poll. Uh, we'll stop on profitability since you guys don't really wanna hear about it. Um, and we're gonna go to Matt. <laughs> to talk about keeping employees productive and happy, because I know that's uh, near and dear to your heart. Yes, well let me kind of throw one back. I know no, we're, we're, we're moving on. No, 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 I think short-term ROI needs to be replaced with long-term relationships. That, and, and then you build uh, life uh, uh, over time and, and experiences. But on the, on the keeping, uh, you want to go on the keeping employees productive and happy, it looks like everybody else wants to go on that. So we should have all gone skiing today together. Yeah. How come we missed it? <laughs> so what were you guys doing here? No, I, I think it's a uh, part is being a uh, uh, really part, big part of it's being playful. I think we've sterilized uh, a lot of uh, uh, things, both for our guests, uh, our staff, and for our communities. And I think we need to, to look at how uh, they, they have a life of their own, and we need to engage in that life and, and really uh, let the sparks fly. You know, how many, when was the last time you sat around the campfire with your team and drank beer and talked about powder days together, right? You gotta do that more often. You gotta engage with your team, you gotta engage with your guests, and you gotta really, really support your team, really believe in them. And it's not paying lip, lip service to that anymore. It's really getting at the heart of it. Heart and soul, lead with the heart. 
Someone else want to comment? Yeah, I think that, I think that uh, what's connected to that is um, providing more opportunities for these employees as well. And, and what's connected back to that is this notion of being able to, to stretch out the, um, the, the, your experience and get into those shoulder seasons where there are other things and other business elements and other assets that you bring on that you can continue to give those employees opportunities. Because, you know, ultimately, we all get into this where we have great employees and they bounce up against some kind of a ceiling at the resort, whether it's related to you know, a lack of business or a lack of other things for them to do. I think the notion of, of expanding your assets also connects to employee, employee um, you know, productiveness and keeping them happy because they have other, other opportunities. Yep. Yeah, and I touched on it uh, in the answer before, but uh, as ski resorts, we're very focused on guest service. And you know we, we do research, on-mountain research, where we talk to folks uh, in our restaurants or in the lift mazes or on the gondola and ask them about their guest experience. And we've been doing that for years, just like every other resort um, uh, through RRC and uh, getting some valuable data really focused on the guest experience. And it, we kind of came to the realization a couple years ago when we, uh, the first question you ask somebody when you do a, a research question is, you know, uh, are you an employee or are you a guest? And if the person would be uh, out of uniform, obviously, um, and the, the respondent would say, I'm an employee, the researcher would, would say, thank you very much, and they'd go the other direction. And it would almost, well, it would send the, the message that says, your opinion doesn't matter. I'm here to survey guests. And we kind of came to the realization that we needed to start surveying our employees. So. When a researcher goes up and talks to a, a person or a guest, the first question they say, are you an employee or are you a guest? And we have a different series of questions we're gonna ask our employees because we wanna hear from them. And it's all about listening and making sure we respond. We do, not, not only do we do an annual survey now where it's more in depth, employee opinion survey that we kind of look at those results on an annual basis and try to you know, take action items to address some of those things that. Uh, come up in those surveys, but we look at our results on a weekly basis uh, for the first time in several years, and we've been doing that um, for three years now. So you gain a lot of insights, and you listen to your employees, and that'll make them happier. Great. So let's switch it a little bit, Jörg, and talk about a way to keep your employees happy is to give them year-round jobs, uh, year-round full-time benefits, et cetera. Too many employees are part-time, uh, or seasonal, I should say. Uh, and don't get all that benefit because the ski areas aren't able to support that. What do you see in the Alps in terms of your summer season is very strong? Uh, are there more and more full-time year-round jobs available to the employees out there? This is indeed a challenge we have. We have two strong seasons, winter, summer. Autumn is half strong, and then what we have what you call the mud season, yeah? yeah. This is uh, April, May, where it's closed. So we have uh, more and more, we see more and more that... Uh, it's a year-round uh, uh, season, but still this is a challenge we have. And obviously, you need the year-round to be able to employ the people, to give them career opportunities, to give them perspectives, to educate them. If you have to change them every year, every season, it's a challenge. So in Switzerland, this is why we believe to build up a strong summer season is really vital to develop the service level, to keep maintain the service level. And we have to make sure we bring the best talents into our industry. And if you love to hear it or not, this has also to do with salary level, yeah? If you uh, pay low salary, you may not be uh, very attractive to get the best talents. So salary level is an issue. So again, let's stay on the summer theme and year-round theme. That's what people are interested in hearing about. Um, we, you've talked a lot, Steve, so far about investing in your infrastructure. What have you seen? Has it really impacted? your employees where you are able to provide more year-round jobs? Yeah, it definitely has. And, and for us, it isn't necessarily just the, uh, um, just the shoulder season and extending through the summer. It's about providing non-traditional uh, non winter business to, to augment the skiers, right? Because you know, to the extent we can, we can impact guest experience and all day long, but to the extent that our profit is tied to um, a good winter and skiers coming and more skiers coming and buying more things, we're, like I said, we're always going to be subject to how the, how the winter and how the weather is, is doing. You know, what we found is that 
we brought this hockey rink in, and we thought that this was purely going to be, you know, we're going to sell a few uh, learn to skate lessons. Our existing guests would be able to skate around, and it would be fantastic. But we weren't, we weren't looking to that to really compress our logic. And what we found out is that um, we, we hired an employee to come in who had a hockey background to specifically look at, you know, how do we, how do we make more money at this? And at this point now, we have 45 weekends worth of hockey tournaments. Now, they start on Thursday night. They run through Sunday. We do 12 to 16, usually 16 teams a weekend. Each team rents 12 to 15 rooms. So we've got 300, I'm not very good at math, but I think that 350 rooms every weekend, completely un, untethered to weather, um, that you can count on every weekend. Now, hockey, I don't know how many hockey parents there are, but they don't like to, they don't like to spend money uh, necessarily <laughs> on, <laughs> on lodging. But, you know, because of the situation that Jay Peak is in, we get all the per caps. We get the, every dollar of food. We get every dollar of the water park. Some of them end up skiing. They, they, they get into our retail shops. Um, and we completely had discounted uh, beforehand as an as a, as a executive team the impact that that, that that unit could have on profitability. So that in and of itself has brought in opportunities for other employees. We've got a staff of five or six people completely dedicated to the rink at this point and trying to grow that, that individual segment. So Rob, uh, as well as Ski Town USA, I I believe you're officially Bike Town USA or something. Yes. Is that exactly it? Yes. Also trademarked? Yes. Yes. So how is, uh, I mean, biking has gotten to be huge at Steamboat. And so what have you seen in summer? And has that been enough to bridge the gap of fall? And we caught mud season here too. Yeah. Um, we're very focused, obviously, on, on growing our summer business. Uh, we have a visitation in terms of traffic through the, through the community. Uh, whether it's the Triple Crown baseball events or art festivals, concerts, music series. Uh, it's just a series of events throughout the summer. Uh, Steamboat's always been known as a biking destination, great road biking, great cross-country uh, biking. Uh, three years ago, we put in the Steamboat Bike Park, so now we have downhill mountain biking. So it's really a mecca of mountain biking, and uh, you really need to have four bikes, including a cruiser, if you're going to be uh, considered a, a biker in steamboat. And we're very focused on continuing to grow our summer business. Um, this summer, we're putting in a mountain coaster, uh, so we're very excited to put that in up at the resort. Uh, we're also putting in a mini golf course and just adding to the overall uh, offerings that we have in the summer with the goal of offering more year-round jobs, more opportunities for our staff to stay within the community to give them an opportunity to earn a living and create a lifestyle in the Yampa Valley. So uh, it's been going great. We continue to see our summer business grow uh, and we're very focused on diversifying our business, not just in the winter, but the summer as well. You have something on that or could we go to the next? Yeah, summer. go, yeah. A little bit of summer, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think the, the, the key, key point, uh, fitting the mountain lifestyle, because the, the passion of our team members uh, really enjoying all the activities they enjoy, it really has given us the opportunity to embrace the uh, unique brands for each of our resorts. Like, for example, Kicking Horse Mountain Resort in Golden, British Columbia, uh, we just put in a new uh, Via Ferrata, which uh, is probably one of the uh, more challenging Via Ferratas in, in North America. Um, but what we're seeing, because the dynamics, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the community is made up of, of such mountain enthusiasts. We have a lot of guides. We have a lot of uh, who guide in the climbing industry or the, the heli ski industry or the backcountry touring operations that work for us. This gives us some opportunity to not only work for us in the uh, shoulder season because we open early, the resort early, uh, and, and furthers their opportunity to obviously continue living in the community of Golden and, and pursuing their passion uh, for adventure. Uh, we also have our largest employee, uh, is a grizzly bear, and, and uh, his name is Boo, and Boo, uh, unfortunately, his, his uh, mom was hit uh, by a truck on the highway, um, but the uh, opportunity uh, our team embraced was to uh, try to show, uh, working with biologists, that uh, bears could, um, instead of having to um, do the, the horrible thing of, of shoot the cubs, so what, what the, the wildlife officers do, unfortunately, when they come to those scenes, uh, we thought uh, that our team embraced the idea of could we prove that bears can uh, already are innately inside, have the skill to survive on their own without their mom's teaching. And, and so we built a 25-acre uh, uh, refuge, 
And, and Boo has, uh, has proven that. Unfortunately, we can't let him go uh, now because he's also become great friends with all the wonderful people that visit him regularly. But it's provided a, another opportunity to expand on uh, our commitment, uh, education, natural environment, uh, uh, get our guests, uh, uh, giving them that opportunity, but also our, our staff's passion uh, for uh, ecology, for biology, uh, for, for natural uh, heritage. Interesting, boo, okay. So let's switch to the next topic that uh, the audience really wanted to hear about which is the for rent by owner issue. Uh, we are gonna hear from HomeAway later today. We have, we're gonna hear from Airbnb later today. So those are the two big leaders in this industry as well as uh, Flipkey, which is owned by TripAdvisor and Booking.com also has quite a bit of vacation rentals. But the for rent by owner issue is really come up in resorts in a big way. Uh, let's start with you, Rob, because I know there's a ton of those kind of units in Steamboat. And there's some pros and there's some cons. And uh, what would you discuss regarding that topic? You know, we've heard from uh, our previous speakers about innovating and adapting. And that's what, you know, we're in this environment where we need to do that. Uh, I think it's provided some opportunities in terms of more folks to the resort. That's better for everybody, mm -hmm. providing accommodations and um, and it's also provided challenges uh, in terms of competition for our lodging uh, offerings, but also competition for beds for our employees. You know, we're seeing this affordable housing uh, crunch across the resort communities. We're not immune to it in Steamboat. Uh, and I think it has been impacted by some of the for rent by owner uh, trends that we're seeing, but it's not gonna go away and we're not gonna make it go away. So we need to adapt our business practices to to deal with it, and uh, obviously we're doing that uh, in terms of you know making ourselves better in terms of what we offer our homeowners to be a part of our rental management program, and the other um, uh, property management companies within the community really need to up their game as well. And that way, you know, you can compete and offer uh, a, a, a just as good a service uh, with the for rent by owners. And uh, I think we're all probably going to be better for it in the long run and uh, it provides an opportunity and some challenges that we need to adapt to, so. I mean, certainly it's disruptive, and I know it's going on in Europe as well. So what have you yep. seen in the Alps? Uh, I mean, obviously every new sales, sales channel that brings customer to the Alps is a great new sales channel. Uh, Airbnb is growing fast. It's not yet big, but it's growing fast. It's big in the cities in Europe. Uh, it's getting into uh, the leisure travel business uh, in the Alps. Now, we are welcoming them in the same moment. We believe that they have ful to fulfill the same criteria as every other player. So they have to, pro they have to give the uh, tourist taxes, etc. And uh, this is not yet working. So this is a big legal thing that's going on now in Europe. But I think they have to adapt to that. But it's a great platform and it has, I'm sure, a great future. What's going on up in uh, the northern northeast kingdom? Well, it's mud season right now in the northeast. <laughs> <laughs> That's happening. Um, yeah. For for us, we don't really. There's no supportive lodging community, either private or uh, you know through uh, through individuals who are on the Airbnb platform in and around the community. So we we pretty much own the lodging game. With our homeowners, we have you know roughly 300 homeowners. They have to either participate through our program uh, in total. Uh, they have to, we have to be the sole renter of their, of their units or we don't allow them in the program because there's too, much, there's too much potential for confusion and crossover. But I think Rob's right that you know, it, it, for, it will force the industry to come up with, with better strategies and, and those for us being we own the lift ticket um, so we can package that and our other per cap amenities in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. And it forces us to, to really try to leverage the fact that we own the ski in, ski out lodging for the most part. Um, so, you know, how do, we, how do we use that as a competitive advantage to try to get our share? So you're not really dealing with the issue at this point, at no. Jay specifically? No, not directly, I'm no. I'm sure you're dealing with it at a number of your resorts. We are. And what's been the approach? Well, the, the, a little bit different than the, the way that the uh, destination marketing organizations are funded in Canada. So, so the, the challenge is that uh, the fees that are collected aren't collected by, at, by the uh, for rent by owner or, or by the Airbnb participants. But on the other side of it, I think it's uh, a huge uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, many of them provide local experts. I, I'm really, we really think that that's really beneficial. They, they, uh, the people are passionate about the place, so that's really beneficial. I mean, it's a sharing economy. It's a, it's a form of distribution that is really 
uh, taking off, and I, and I think it's, uh, it's something that we totally, uh, we've embraced it and, and continue to work through it, um, but certainly it does provide some challenging uh, dynamics, uh, uh, definitely, uh, for all the tourism uh, tr attractions. And certainly taxation and regulation are two big things, and I know for sure that HomeAway and Airbnb both specifically are working a lot on that and on a community by community, city by city basis. And you know, a lot of cities, it's getting taxed now. Yep. Um, they put things into place so the homeowners can charge the customer the tax. Yep. And that's all coming. It's Change just a matter of time. It's, it's just a matter of time, yeah. Yep. Um, let's fast forward over to customer experience. Uh, Matt has been at it for 22 years talking about customer experience. He gave us a good intro. I'm sure you all have your own ideas about, you know, what are some innovation, what innovative ideas that are out there that does bring that thrill of I want to go skiing and snowboarding to the hassle of bringing my family through the parking lot, dragging their skis, and making that customer experience as good as it possibly can. Uh, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I mean, Mike touched on it uh, with the red wagons. I think we're all seeing those red wagons in our villages, you know, around the industry to provide, you know, an easy way for families to make it more convenient. Um, I was joking with some friends the other night at dinner. I have two daughters, and you know, uh, to get them to go skiing when all their equipment is steps away from the gondola and they have parking and all that, oh, what a hassle! And and we need to work uh, as an industry to try to make it easier uh, for folks to uh, uh, make our resorts more accessible. And we're focused on that at Steamboat and across the Interwest uh, family of resorts. We talk about effortless and what can we do to make it easier for our guests to experience our resorts. And once you get onto a ski lift or you're sliding down the hill with your family or your grandparents and the grandchildren, it is magical. And to get to that point, it takes some effort. So we're you know, looking at all our processes, uh, including the rental, including the lift tickets, including you know, uh, what it takes to get to that point and trying to make it easier and cut out uh, any place that uh, we make it effortful, if that's a word. So have you seen anything that's really made a difference towards that effortless experience? Yeah, we've, we were really focused on uh, a couple things. We focused on our, our rental experience um, and we've also put in RFID uh, last year uh, at uh, both Winter Park and Steamboat. Uh, that has uh, obviously, you know, you don't have to take out your season pass uh, at the lifts anymore. Uh, that's been received incredibly well. And now folks obviously can reload uh, their lift tickets. Those will last uh, uh, for a long time. So you just go online, reload it for the days you want to ski, you get a discount, and it makes it easier so you don't have to wait in, you know, a lift ticket line or in the ticket office to buy your lift ticket and then go wait in the lift line to get onto the mountain. So. Yeah. Those are two areas that we're really focused on. What's going on in the Alps? I mean, the effortless is really uh, the big topic we have. We in Switzerland, we have worked a lot because we believe it starts at home on the luggage transfer. Uh, so if you fly, for example, by Swiss Airlines, you only have one national airline. We're a small country. Yeah? <laughs> uh, you, you check in your luggage, and it's directly uh, routed through to the hotel. So you don't have to pick it at the airport. You find it a few uh, hours later in the hotel room. The same is true if you're Swiss at home. Swiss Federal Railways uh, comes and takes the luggage. The skis, by the way, on air, they are for free. So uh, the luggage transfers, we believe this is where the hassle starts because you all know if you're a family with three kids and you have the skis and the ski boots, I mean, yeah. Now the difference in the Alps, especially when it comes to Switzerland, uh, and we're very proud of that, you have a train basically to every destination, a lovely high quality train, so traffic is not really a hassle, but I still believe we have as an industry to reduce the complexity. It takes still too many steps till you, from the moment you arrive till you are on the slope, and I couldn't agree more, once you're on there, the experience is, out, is, is outstanding, but there's still too many steps. We're working very much on that, yeah. So Steve, you're you're known to be an innovator. You've done some great things in Vermont. So don't just talk to me about Jay Peak, but talk to us about what you've seen throughout the East and or anywhere that you've seen some really cool innovative ideas to make it seamless. Well, I, I would I would say that you know I'd answer that in, in two ways. We've we've had RFID for four or five years now, and it's and it's been you know it's been a uh, most of our hardcore guests still think there's witchcraft involved with that, and they're a little freaked out about the entire <laughs> thing. But you know the index of our guests are hardcore, so. 
to some extent, we've sort of stepped into the punch a little bit with the whole notion of it being a pain in the ass to ski. And we've tried to spin that with that audience to say, and it really isn't spin, it's, um, you know, anything worth experiencing, something as fantastic as skiing, is there has to be some effort put into it. And there's a responsibility on behalf of the guests that they have to put some energy into getting uh, into the sport that's, that it should be looked at as an investment, really. Um, and we've done some of the other things that every resort has done in terms of being able to, you know, provide these soft amenities, get people to the slopes easier, make the rental process easier. Um, but one thing we haven't figured out yet, and, and people will realize this as they bring in other, these types of assets, is that we haven't, we haven't yet figured out the key to turning water parkers and hockey folks into skiers. And that's the piece that we're, we're really working on at this point, is how do you turn somebody that is okay with sitting, uh, sitting in the middle of a water park for six hours in a lounge chair where the kids run around uh, into being a skier that takes some effort. And that's really where we've, it doesn't really answer your question directly, but it's something that as, as other resorts bring in non-skiers to, to the mountain, they need to figure out strategies to turn them into skiers if they're going to continue to be profitable. When, when you figure out the hockey one, let us know. I will. <laughs> we're a ways away. We're closer to the water parkers than we are the hockey folks right now. Okay, so we're going to go into our final lightning round, which means you'll each have one minute to provide info about one of the topics we talked about today that really is giving everyone in the audience a key takeaway. So give them something to take out of here that they can go back, think about, maybe put on Josh's disruptive hat and come out with an idea from your session. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I guess uh, looking at your own experience, uh, I think uh, get your team uh, uh, to break down barriers, integrate the team together when looking at your experience, uh, and look at it from, uh, I think, a real perspective of, of being playful, uh, of really finding that, uh, that inner kid inside. And it takes a little uh, to do this, but uh, you can do it, and, and uh, you will see a difference. And, and again, it's not the, the short-term return, but it's the long-term relationship that matters. Rob? Uh, I think Kirsten touched on it, uh, Josh touched on it, you know, how do, how do we be more innovative? Uh, we're in an industry that we talk a lot about being stagnant, uh, flat in terms of skier days, that's the metric um, that we use. How can we continually adapt and innovate uh, to, to make our industry more healthy and, and vibrant? And uh, thankfully we're not sitting in a medical conference right now. Um, and I talk uh, with my team and, and my colleagues about it. And I say, you know, we're not performing heart surgery here. If we have an idea and we're going to try something unique or innovative, nobody's going to die on the operating table if we fail. And some of the best lessons we can learn is by failure. And I would challenge this group to get it innovative and try new things because uh, nobody's going to die on the operating table. And thank goodness we're not in the... Uh, uh, medical um, uh, profession. <laughs> Jörg. Just a few thoughts about customer experience and uh, love to share a uh, market research study we did in Switzerland that may not be true for the US, but uh, we found basically out the customer experience is not customer experience. We have on one side the people there get a bit older, best agers. We found out that women in average stop skiing at the age of 61, a man at the age of 64. That may, that's only Switzerland, yeah? And so obviously we now design the processes to a total perfect customer experience. If we gain three, four more years of them, this is where we can really can boost the skier days, make good business, and this is the generation that has the money and the time, yeah? And this is obviously what our industry needs. On the other side, we realize that it drops uh, the uh, chances that somebody learns skiing if you pass the age of 16, it drops in Switzerland by 85%. So you, if you haven't started skiing when you're young, you most probably will never. And in the age of 30 or 40, the chances are so little that you uh, start skiing. So we have said we have to design the customer experience for the young ones and we have launched a nationwide Kids on Ski program where really every school, this is the dream, goes a week skiing, the kids go a week skiing. Now the good thing is every city is close to the mountains in Switzerland, but still so, uh, it's great effort to be effortless, yeah. So what's the key takeaway? 
The key takeaways, we all, the industry, has to do a lot to create more skiers. We are stagnating, and there we have a common task and responsibility to really create more skiers. Steve, um, I, I, would, I would frame it in terms of something that we, and more specifically me, sincerely failed at when we went through the process of growing, and it connects to what Rob was saying and what, what Kirsten was saying, which was we held too close to who we thought we were as a brand for too long as we were bringing in assets that were completely foreign to us. And we didn't want the water park, we didn't want this, we didn't want these many restaurants, we didn't want 700 rooms because we were so involved with who we thought we were. And it took us too long, definitely took me too long, to be able to disassociate from that and really have the courage to say, all right, we're, you know, we need to bring in these other assets. So the, you know, the takeaway is, is what we all talk about is don't grow so fond of who you are that it stops you from becoming something different. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Musteller, Rob Perlman, Jurek Schmidt, and Steve Wright. Thank you.